I gave I gave the title as well, Science in Two Languages, <laughs> Two Living Free for Today. <laughs> Looking at the audience, I suppose it's better if I speak English. <laughs> okay. So, I don't have one. I will speak very... Uh, it, uh, give only very few words about the life of Groot and Dick. It's not the purpose of this talk. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, a few days ago I received a movie which has been made by some colleagues in, in, in um, Toulouse about Groot and Dick, but doesn't, well, we have no new, in, in this movie there is no new document about Groot and Dick <coughs> himself. And I recommend for people who are not aware that there is a so-called Grotenic Circle site, at, uh, which is maintained by Leila Schneps, and it gives a lot of information about, about Grotenic, his document, and so on. Everything which has not been censored by Grotenic himself. I'm sorry, because I checked that website, but the website seems to be done. done, done. Yeah. done. Yes. And disappeared? Yes. I mean, I checked a few days ago because I was trying to get this. Uh, we found the standard conjecture, and I, the, web, the website seems to be done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. So, uh, but in the secret archive of our institute, <coughs> we have also some document about the Golden League. Okay. So, just a few words about the life of Golden League. Well, Golden League. Uh, well, where's the joke? Wotendik was born on the 28th of March of 1928 in Berlin. And as a result, we don't have a physical proof of his existence because all the documents disappeared uh, at the end of the <laughs> Second World War. And it which made some difficulty with him when, because he, he was a stateless and so forth. So his family, his family background. I mean, his father was uh, was two names, uh, uh, Shapira or Shapiro, I don't know, and Tanao. By birth, he was Shapiro Shapira, which means that he is is born in a very small, special place. All Shapira come from a special geographical area, which is now a triple point between Ukraine, Belarus, and. Uh, and uh, Russia. And so, f f very, f this is a, well, Shapira is a Jewish name, and these were very, very obedient Jews, and uh, sometimes called uh, I mean, the, the fool of God, and, okay, so they were, and sometimes, well, what we are called, the, what are they called now? I mean, the uh, Hasidim or what? Okay, okay. okay, so, and then his, so his father started, I mean, so, his father started his career at the age of 13 or 14 in the first Russian Revolution, 1905, by enlisting in some um, military anarchist group in Ukraine, and, uh, which, and they, they fought against the Tsar, and they resisted two years after the collapse of the 1905 revolution. They, they, they remained for two years, in the, in, mostly in the forest, and uh, finally, they were all caught, and uh, 1907, something like that, and they were all sentenced to death. But uh, Tanarov was considered too young and irresponsible, so he was not shot. He was among the few people who were not shot at the time, but he spent many years in jail. And uh, he left jail during First World War around 1915 or 1916, and uh, just to just before the Soviet Revolution, well, first of all, the Menshevik Revolution, uh, the Soviet Revolution, and he participated, he was in St. Petersburg, he participated at these events, but there is sometimes a confusion because there is another political figure with the same name as him, which is often confused with the father. He totally himself seemed to, to have made the confusion. Okay, so, and so in, in 1917, he participated to the, to the revolution in St. Petersburg, and, uh, but uh, when the, the, the Bolshevik won and, and Lenin killed all his uh, friends, political friends and political enemies, and so uh, Gotendik's father, who was Shapira Tanarov, 
was again sentenced to death, if I'm quiet. <laughs> and so, uh, as Gotenik mentioned to me sometime, my father has been sentenced to death twice in Russia, one by the Tsar, one by Lenin. <laughs> it is a rather good description of his, the life of his father. <laughs> so, his father was very active, so after that, his father was very active in various revolutionary groups. He was in Berlin, with uh, Rosa Luxemburg, he was in, uh, in Budapest, with Belakun, he was in many places. And I remember mentioning to him, oh, your father would deserve to be in the Who is Who of Revolution. And he did not know what Who is Who was, so I explained to him, my father would have been unhappy to be in the Who is Who. No, I mean the Who is Who of Revolution. <laughs> okay. So, and then, uh, after many events, I mean, so, he spent many years in the well, about 10 years in, uh, in Berlin, from 1920 to 1930, approximately. And then he met, he met uh, the um, Anka Grotendieck, who is the, father, the mother of uh, Alexander Grotendieck, who was a, a young German lady, who had already one daughter, and who was, I mean, the, uh, publishing in the leftist newspaper, uh, the German leftist newspaper at the time. She was a feminist and, uh, and a socialist. So, and then they met and they, they lived together for a while and they had, Rotenik was born out of their union. And, uh, but then when Hitler came, they had to leave. Of course, they were not welcome under Nazi rule. So both father and mother, so I repeat, his mother was, on, uh, well, he was called uh, Sasha, or Alexander if you want, and his mother was called Anka Rotenik. So Gotenik is really the name of his mother. And I checked that uh, in the north of Germany, Gotenik is a quite common name, family name. So they left, both left Germany around 1932 at the advent of the Nazi rule. And uh, they went in different places. Uh, but then Gotenik was left behind. He was left behind in a foster family near Hamburg uh, the people who took care of Gotendik were, I mean, the, the head of the family was a previous uh, Lutheran pastor, Lutheran reverend, who had left the church and who was a, a well, kind of an artist, and who had a private school in the manner of uh, what was recommended by, uh, by uh, Bertrand Rosso. Bertrand Rosso at that time was a fond of uh, the education princi the principle, and then this, this private school was run by uh, along similar principle, and uh, then a number of Jewish children were hosted in this school. So it lasted uh, for, uh, for some years, but in 1930, 1938, everything became too dangerous. This man, of course, was under, of course, uh, suspicion by, by the Nazis and the Gestapo, and then he had to to get old, to get rid of Gotteny. So uh, they managed, he managed to get into contact with the Gotteny mother who was in Paris at the time, and through the French consulate in Hamburg, they were 39, remember, 38, remember, shortly before Second World War. So they managed to, to con come into contact with, uh, with, his mother, with his mother, and Gotteny was put in a train at Hamburg for 12 hours of, 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 of uh, train to, to Paris, with the only instruction, someone is waiting for you in Paris. <laughs> so it was his mother. He hardly remember his mother at the time when he was, he, he left, his, mo uh, his mother left him when he was four or something like that. But then he was reunited with his mother, and, but his mother, there was a half-sister, and the half-sister remained in Germany. She was in a kind of well religious religious school kept what well, Jewish student kept by religious school, which was not so common, and she managed to survive on, uh, during the Second World War. And then, but Gotenik was reunited with his mother, but not with his father, because his father, as well as his mother, had been participate, uh, participated to the civil war in Spain, and uh, so. The mother came back, the mother came back uh, 37, but shortly before the collapse of the Republican, uh, Republicans in Spain and the victory of the fascists. But uh, Grotenik father remained behind. And uh, it is told that he was a member of the Duruti column, 
the Houthi colony was a small army from the anarchists in, the, in Barcelona who tried to, 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 to get hold of Madrid from the fascists. They, they failed. And it seems that Gotham Father was part of this small army. And uh, it would be amusing to see whether Gotham Father and Simon Weil met because they were at the same time in the same, among the same political groups in Barcelona. At least, if someone wants to, to write a play, I recommend it. It should be a good play. Okay, so, Gotham Father was, as, after the collapse of the Republican in, uh, in Spain, there were a number of refugees, very number, very large number of refugees, who were not welcome in France, not at all welcome in France. And, uh, well, if you look more carefully, you will see that France was already half fascist in 39, 38, 39, half fascist. Not really fascist, but half fascist. And uh, uh, Stalin uh, worsened the situation by making this alliance with Hitler. And so the French government had a good excuse to expand the communists from all positions and putting them in jail and so on. And you suppose that God, God and the, they did not make much difference between God and the father who was a Russian anarchist and communist, of course. <laughs> so, and so God and the father was sent to a detention camp. And these detention camps were created around 37 in France, maybe earlier, maybe, but certainly 37. And the number of refugees foreign are, were taken into this camp. They were not death camp like the Nazi camp, but they were not very pleasant. And so, and uh, Gothenburg, but Gothenburg was not reunited, so he hardly met his father, hardly met his father, if I'm correct. And so, but then his mother, he was with his mother, and they were all both taken this time, as, as a, when the Second World War started, as enemy citizens. They were both German by law, so <laughs> were enemy citizens. So they were put in a camp. And they survived with some difficulty. Uh, it would be too long to, to tell all the stories, but what is known is that uh, he, he was in Mad, in Mad, and, uh, in Mad, and there was a camp. And he was allowed to, his mother was not allowed to leave the camp, but he was allowed to go out to attend high school. And uh, then, when things became worse, and uh, when the French collapse in June 1940, it was not of not much help for these people. They were for a few weeks out of jail, but put in another jail immediately after that. And then Gothenburg's um, mother survived with much difficulty in various camps. And Gothenburg himself was taken as a student in a, private, a Protestant private school in, the, in the Le Chambon sur Lino, which was a major place of the resistance of the, of the uh, resistance of the Protestants against the Nazi. As some people commented to me ten years later, we fought the armies of the King Louis XIV. Hitler was not worse. <laughs> that was the spirit of these people. Okay, so. Okay, Gothenburg. So Gothenburg managed to, to at least he, he, he had rather regular uh, teaching in this uh, Protestant high school, and uh, with was well, I mean, it, well, I mean it's, a, it's a history, it's a story in itself. But so he, he managed to get his baccalaureate, and then after that he was a student in Montpellier, and it was clear that he knew already more mathematics than most of his teachers there, and uh, he had. He, his teacher recommended to him that said that, well, if you have any question, ask Mr. Lebec, and he has all the answers. <laughs> and after this uh, recommendation, Grothendieck rebuilt his own version of Lebec integration in a very, very general form, ignorant of everything which has been known of course, at the time. The textbook by Sachs existed, I mean, the, 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 the um, this Nazi existed, but he, he was not aware of that. So he reconstructed that. And then a good stroke of luck was that a friend of, of uh, Henri Carton and André Veil, was called Magnan, was, uh, well, he was not an academic, he was part of the bureaucracy of the edu national education. So his task was to go around France just after the war and to spot good, very promising young students who needed support. And so he was going around in, in various high schools, and his mission was to discover young talents and to provide them with proper fellowships. And that's what has happened with Grotendieck. So he got a fellowship out of this man, and uh, 
In, if you read now the exchange of letters between Henri Carton and André Vey, you will find there are, this is mentioned in this exchange of letters. So, Botany completed this so-called licence in Montpellier, and then in '48 he was given this fellowship, which enabled him to go to Paris. And then he went, he had a recommendation to Carton, Eddy, the father, <laughs> <laughs> because one of his teachers in Montpellier had did you, well, I suppose his master thesis or something like that, who is called, what, I don't remember what was the exact title of the time, but kind of master thesis with Elie Carton. And so he had got a recommendation for Elie Carton. When he arrived in Paris, he discovered that Elie Carton has almost died. He died in 51, and he was already very bad. And, uh, but that he had the successor, Henri Carton. So in, a 40, in 1948, uh, uh, Gotenik arrived in Paris and uh, attended uh, at with a recommendation to Carton the father or Carton the son, doesn't matter. And then he attended the Carton seminar, it was the first year of the famous Carton seminar, 1948 to 1949. And uh, it was topology and he confessed and she flew and he confessed. After that he confessed that he understood very little. But nevertheless, people were impressed because in the back of the audience there was a young man, very brave and very bored, who asked any kind of many questions to Carton. Well, people who have known Carton quite formal <laughs> can imagine the contrast between the personality of uh, of Rotenik, who was like a, a young dog at the time, <laughs> and uh, there are pictures of him at the time. He looks like a young dog, and the uh, and. Carton the father, Carton the son was the very formal Protestant. <laughs> formal Protestant. But, but finally, well, it did not go very well. But at the end of the year, um, yeah, there was a discussion between Carton and the very, maybe there is some, something in his, in his published letters. And uh, the very said, well, obviously it's not proper for him to stay with you, but we will send him to Nancy. At the time in Nancy, there was uh, Dieudonné and Laurent Schwartz, and other people as well, but men, men, two major, two more towering figures were uh, um, um, Dieudonné and Schwartz. Schwartz had just uh, begun his career as a founding father of distribution, distribution. and so Gotteny came to Nancy and he ended to, to, to Dieudonné his, his exposition of the generalized uh, Lubeck integration. And uh, you can imagine what people who have met Dieudonné uh, can imagine. Young man, young man. This is all known. This is all known. This is all known. Okay. But if you want something serious, I can give you something serious. And he had just finished uh, to write a paper with, uh, with Laurent Schwarz on the foundation, functional analysis foundation for distribution theory. And at the end of the paper, which was not yet printed, there were 14 major questions. And you see, young man, try your teeth on that. And uh, according to the, to the legend, it took him a few weeks or a few months to solve all these problems, and uh, a few months later he had already something publishable. Okay, then, and then, now I will stop for that, because one of my aims today is to insist on the first phase of the career of Grotendieck, which is less known than the second phase, and uh, which ought to be better known. But for that, I have, I have a document, I have a document which is a schistematic des principaux travaux mathématiques de Grotendieck. That's a paper he wrote, uh, 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 well, kind of CV he wrote in seven, 1972, and you said that there is a copy in, this, uh, in, in, in the files. Okay. So, I don't remember how he got it, but it's, so it's a, uh, I think it was at the time he was, a, he was, he was applying for a position at Collège de France. 72, that fits. That's it, okay. I will not tell the story, which is entangled and complicated. <laughs> it's not my purpose today. So, but then Grotteny gives his own account of, his own overview of his work, which is a very, very interesting document. So, the first section is functional analysis. And I will start with that. So functional analysis, what was it? There was so the, the first of this discovery of distributions 
Vai, l'uomo non sta. Penso volete che fuori. Ecco, esatto. <laughs> ok. Some people mentioned <laughs> earlier paper by Sobolev in 19... So this is around 1947-48. And there is a... And that's true, there is a, paper, there a few papers by Sobolev 10 years before. But there is a difference. Sobolev published very high, highly technical papers combined... It appeared as a new method for solving the kind of partial differential equation. And Sobolev, shortly after that, was taken into the military industrial complex of Soviet Union and he did not publish much about that because his work was classified work. On the other hand, Groten, well, Schwarz, Schwarz, well, I, I, can, I, I can admit that Schwarz never really understood the so-called so -called space. <laughs> it's true that he never did not want I mean, no, he, he did not know how, what, how to use it. But, but The point is that Laurent Schwartz, the genius of Laurent Schwartz, was to create obvious things. I mean, to, to take something which was there, but no one saw it before, and to make it a very efficient and simple tool. So distribution are a very simple tool. But it provided an immense, immense, immense progress. And I can say that, for instance, ten years later, when, when Five years later, when I was a student, when I, when my group, the group of my generation, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, Brua, Malgrange, and uh, Martino, other people, we all learned from our master, Laurent, <laughs> this new technique. And during five years, we were really ahead of everyone else in various fields because we knew this new tool. Since the tool is easy, <laughs> many, within five years, many people absorb it and to get benefit of it. But th that was a special genius of Laurent Schwarz, to make simple discover, simple definition, simple discovery, and to dis discover simple but very <coughs> efficient tools. So I will not enter into the discussion about, about between Sobolev and Schwarz. Which is okay. But then, distributions, good. Get fun. Get fun also. I come. No, no, no. There was also somebody before somebody another. Okay. 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 <laughs> I come to Gelfand. Okay. So what has happened? Uh, this well, Gelfand understood immediately what he could do with that. And if you compare the book published by Laurent Schwartz himself about distribution, which is rather high bro and uh, quite formal, quite quite formal. And if you compare the books published by Gelfand and his collaborator at the same time, you see the difference. The book by Gelfand and his collaborator are very practical. They explain to you what how you deal with this method in various situations. They give you fully transfer and so on. At least, in my opinion, the best discovery of Laurent Schwartz has been a very convenient fully transformation. The rest was more or less known, but fully transformation is really his creation. And it's such an efficient tool, such a beautiful tool. Okay. Again, simple. Once you have it, it's obvious. But you have to know it. You have to know it. So, and this will come again. So, okay, that's Laurent Schwartz and Dieudonné. They resorted on some abstract definition of abstract vector spaces, locally convex, etc. And I remember uh, a comment by Gelfand claiming that I will do. I will do distribution theory without all this first. Something, a statement of Gelfand of this kind, somewhere. So, in one of his books. So, but then, uh, Laurent Schwartz and Dieudonné discovered that they were lacking two foundations for the general tools of functional analysis, locally compact, locally convex vector spaces. And uh, the outcome, the final outcome, was a book by, by, by Go back here on that subject, two, five chapters on that, four plus an additional chapter for Hilbert spaces. So, and Diotone was very instrumental in generalizing the basic result of, of, um, of uh, Banach to non norm spaces. A Banach space is a space which has one norm, and the locally convex spaces are spaces which have a family of norms. Okay. That's the main difference. But okay. But then there was this question, and then von Neumann also. Well, Wiener, well, we will not tell the whole history of functional analysis. 
Dieu de bien, c'est un très bon document, un livre sur ça. Donc, vous devriez mentionner Wiener, vous devriez mentionner Von Norman, beaucoup de personnes. Je ne vais pas m'en dire. Mais le point est qu'ils étaient en train de poser quelques questions, et, comme je l'ai dit, ils ont dit ça. Mais puis, c'est intéressant que, immédiatement après ça, Grotendieck était intéressé dans un problème qui était connecté avec ça. Et une question qui était posée à lui par Laurent Schwarz. Laurent Schwarz était très fond de un théorème qui est appelé le Kernel Theorem, le théorème des Kernels, qui est quelque chose que tous les physiciens doivent admettre. Que si vous avez un fonctionnel opérateur, vous pouvez toujours l'écrire comme un intégral opérateur. So we have a function, an operator acting on linear operator acting on functions with suitable, def, suitable restriction property, provided that you admit that k is not an ordinary function but a generalized function. For instance, Dirac knew that this formula. So the identity operator, certainly not, certainly not an integral operator, but if you invent a generalized function like the Dirac function, which is properly understood as a distribution, is true. So every operator can be represented as an integral operator, and there are many benefits of that. But then uh, Schwarz himself gave a rather uh, complicated proof, resting on various explicit calculations, which were not, well, it was convincing, but not. But then uh, he was not happy with his own uh, proof. And, uh, What he wanted to what he wanted to explore is the idea that what is the meaning of tensor product for an analyst is the following: if you have a function on one variable x and another function variable y, if you take the product with independent variable x and y, that's a function of two variables and is properly represented by the tensor product. It has all the properties that you expect in algebra from a tensor product. So. Rochefort knew that, and he has to, well, he, he, he knew that there was a possibility of reducing his theory of kernels, theorem of kernels to properties of uh, tensor <coughs> product of spaces. Okay. But, but, the question was, so the question by, by Rochefort to Rotendieck was a rather typical one. Can you develop a theory of tensor product valid not in finite dimensional spaces as usual, but for infinite dimensional spaces? That was a program uh, asked by Laurent Schwab to, to uh, Rotendieck. And typically, with Rotendieck, he went very high in the sky. <laughs> very high in the sky. That was his method, to go very high in the sky. He did not try to understand the explicit calculation done by, by, by Laurent Schwartz. Well, uh, Fourier series, what, using Fourier series is not very difficult. But uh, he, he did not want that. He tried to invent a, few, a general theory. And then, to his great dismay, he came back to, to Schwartz and told him, well, I have, not, I have not one notion of tensor product, I have two notions, which, which were not the same. What's two notions? So, he was very embarrassed. He was very embarrassed. And uh, Schwartz also was very embarrassed. Until they both discovered that the clue was to invent a, a, a framework where the two tensor product will coincide. For people who are familiar with uh, um, algebraic, well, with uh, homological algebra, one of them was left exact, the other one was right exact. Well, and then, if they, are, if they coincide, it's exact. And so, <coughs> product is exact, which is, of course, what you can expect, the best that you can expect. For finite dimensional spaces, the tensor product is exact. The ten if you have a, a, an exact sequence, you tensor it by your space, it remains exact. And with all the consequences about QNET theorem and so on. Then, so, but then, and in more general terms, I mean, when Serre invented, uh, invented flat modules uh, in the 50s, it was exactly for that purpose, to have a tensor product which is exact on both sides, okay, which respects exactness of exact sequence. And so, what Gotenic invented is something in functional analysis which has exactly the same property as flat modules in algebra, in algebra and geometry, which is really a very important tool. So, and I just mentioned this because I just want to mention that is, uh, there, was, there is an analytic continuation in his mind 
from what he did in analysis to what he did in algebra. It's exactly the same spirit, the same method. Okay. So, what, uh, so he invented, invented two tensor product, and later on he invented even more. Well, he was not aware at the time that a student of, uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, von Neumann, by the name of, uh, what was his name? What? Well, I had invented, uh, Shatton, Shatton had invented and uh, developed similar ideas. But, uh, but the difference is that for Shatton it was, uh, it was operators in Hilbert space. He wanted to have a control of various classes of operators in Hilbert space. Representing operators as a tensor product in the, in the same way, and but then uh, uh, but he was not interested in more general spaces. Okay, so uh, that was great, and then came out of that the thesis of Gottendick. When this, when Laurent Schwarz and uh, Dudonay were his thesis advisor, mentioned often that when it was time for him to present a thesis, he has already six papers. <laughs> Each one was a very good thesis. <laughs> Same thing happened to me more recently with one of my PhD. Recently. He had already three papers when he, he came to, to defend his thesis. Okay, so, but then he had six papers, all were very relevant, very important, but all very abstract, all very abstract. And then, Finally, what was chosen for his thesis is a combination of two of these papers, which is published in the, by the American Mathematical Society, a fat book of 400 pages. Well, when I say a fat book with Botanic, it's always a fat book. <laughs> it was writing at length, at length, at length. Okay. And then, uh, but then uh, there were two parts. And this is interesting for, uh, to understand this way of thinking. The second part is about um, about uh, um, nuclear spaces. Why nuclear? Because, of course, it, it was motivated by kernel, which is the same as nucleus. So, nuclear spaces. And the first part was, was a very important problem stated by, um, by um, Banach, which is the following. If you have a Banach space, is it true that any so-called compact operator, or completely continuous in some terminology, can be obtained as a limit of operator of finite tank. Can a certain uh, kernel of that be the limit of fi finite decomposition, a finite sum of if f i x g i y. So uh, it was uh, so it was a very, very famous problem and typically the first part of the thesis of Gottendick, which is certainly less relevant today than it was at the time, uh, developed 40 equivalent formulations for this conjecture of Banach. And it was his aim, I think, in what he had in mind, was to invent many, many, many variants. And at the end, it was very typical of his way, instead of solving one problem, he put it in a very big cloud of problems, and one of them is accessible. One of them can be attacked. So, by first, he put all these problems together, and he knows how to go from one to the other one. He studied very carefully the logical connection between all these problems. And then, at the end, one is easier than the other one. He solved it, so he has solved everything. But this time it failed. It failed. So, this thesis, this is a part of his thesis that I never studied very seriously. I have to confess. The second part of nuclear space is I studied very carefully. But not this part. And what happened some years later? That the conjecture was defeated. One discovered counterexamples. First of all, there was a very, in the 70s, only in the 70s, a very, very complicated counterexample. A very complicated uh, Banach space with a very complicated family of operators. But then, finally, there was found, I mean, the, a, a very simple solution. Among, so if you consider what are possible Banach spaces. Well, Hilbert space is certainly a Banach space. Now it is known that if you consider a Banach space, if all continuous operators in a given Banach space, they have a suitable norm, and this is another Banach space. So out of any Banach space, X you can build L of X, which is a set of all compounded linear operators with suitable norm. Take a Hilbert space, very natural. Take 
the, the, the space of all bounded operator in your Very familiar. This space contradicts the conjecture. And so I, I think the solution is really in the space of Gordon, but he did not. He did not. But so uh, I don't remember who did that, but it was in the 70s. In the 70s, it was a great, great progress. So, as you see, that's part of the limitation of Gotenic. Limitation of Gotenic is its major method is to go in the sky. It's like an eagle, not like a frog. Sometimes people compare frogs to eagle. It's an eagle flying very high in the sky, and then, like in modern, te in modern military technology, a drone <laughs> go going over. At the time, it was a Stuka, a German Stuka, <laughs> Stuka plane. And so, Attacking from high in the sky and finding finding his prey there. Okay, so uh, but then the nuclear spaces were I mean, immediately understood by by uh, Gelfond, and Gelfond took great advantage of this, developed it in many ways, and especially what Gelfond did. One of the main contributions of Gelfond is to understand that there was a connection with probability field. And uh, the so-called mean loss theorem, mean loss theorem, which has been pro has proven very, very important later, and especially in the program of so-called constructive quantum field theory, which was a very important one, is uh, a generalization of Fourier transform from finite dimensional spaces to in some infinite dimensional spaces. But the nuclear spaces have the, the virtue to they are infinite dimensional, but nevertheless very close in many ways to finite dimensional. Uh, in a given nuclear space, you can very well approximate the whole space by subspaces of finite dimension in increasing order, and that's one of their properties. So, uh, Gelfond understood that, and at that time, there was a major problem to uh, develop integration theory for the purpose of probability theory in infinite dimensional spaces. And many people, Prohoff and other people, contributed. The Soviet school was very active in that and very successful. And um, and then uh, that was that was the tools of uh, of Gordon. Okay, but then it's not yet the end of his career in functional analysis. There was, well, remember, he was born in twenty eight. He went to Paris in forty eight at the age of twenty. He defended his thesis in fifty three at the age of twenty five. At fifty three, then. He had, well, since he was stateless, because, I mean, uh, his parents, uh, well, his father was a Russian, but uh, was denied uh, a Russian citizenship for political reasons. His mother was a German, but she was denied a, a German citizenship by the Nazis for similar political reasons. And he was a stateless. So at the time, it was not easy for someone who was stateless to find a position in France. Later on, it became better, but at that time it was almost impossible. <coughs> As a result, Gotham until until the 70s had to travel on the so-called uh, nonsense passport, which is a document issued by the United Nations to help people who have no who are stateless. And uh, during the First and Second World War, they were due to hardship of the war. Many people remained stateless. Well, the board of change extremely extensively as a, as a, Samuel Eilenberg mentioned to me, was born in ah, Wolf, 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 Wief, Lemberg, <laughs> a town which changed four or five times name, which is, in recent days you have seen the report of what happened in Wief, the extreme uh, west of uh, Ukraine. And uh, Samuel Eilenberg mentioned to me that his grandmother never went out of her kitchen, I changed four times of nationality. <laughs> she has been Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, etc. Okay. So, uh, yes, so I was. What did I say about Gotenik? Yeah. So, Gotenik was stateless, which did not help for him. And so, to find a position when he. He had a fellowship from the French government, as I mentioned before, but a more permanent position was difficult. So he went to South America, and in Sao Paulo, that was a time where Sao Paulo was a very active center, still today, still today, but at the time 
It was a very active center and many prominent visitors like uh, uh, Oscar Zariski, uh, uh, some Italian mathematician, um, some, some Italian mathematician, Andre Weig, many, many important mathematicians of the time came to visit Sopolo. And they managed a niche for Gotemi. I suppose it was Giordone who managed for him a niche. So Gotemi was uh, hired for one or two years there, and he gave a full course on his subject, the nuclear, uh, the um, topological vector spaces. And uh, this has, well, the, the notes for this, for this lecture have never been taken, the, the, the text, the text no, I mean, the, the notes have not been, they are published in a mimeograph form, but they have never been republished in a more stable form, as far as I know. But when he published this, I mean, <laughs> there was a comment by Diodonet, there is no need to continue to work in this direction. He has solved everything. He has killed the subject. <laughs> okay. So Gottenich gave these lectures in, in South America, in Sao Paulo, and then, but he produced something more interesting. He produced a new paper, a new paper which was uh, uh, he produced a new paper which was called very modestly uh, a short summary of uh, the the theory, but no, what is it? it, it Resume, a short, a short summary of uh, the theory of uh, uh, metrical theory, metrical theory, quantitative theory of nuclear of, uh, norm spaces. And this is a very, very interesting paper, but which is almost forgotten, except by a few people like Pizier, who made his life, his mathematical life out of this. And so this is a very interesting paper and very typical of Gorton. The first half is very abstract, and just we make the transition for the second part, for the rest. He said, I will discard the 14 different kinds of tensor product between Banach spaces that you cannot escape to mention. 14 different ones. Well, if you look carefully, well, of course, he's very well aware of the functorial property of tensor product. Is it exact or not? And what he defines indeed is what came out after his homological uh, 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 algebra, derived functor. You have special functors between Banach spaces, and then you take the derived functors in the stems of homological algebra. He did not know anything about homological algebra, but he more or less, at least he was uh, totally aware of the spirit of it. And so this is supposedly functional analysis, but it's really ultimately the the, 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 the way of thinking is already very functorial. The name of category, the name of functor appears nowhere, and he did not have the language to express that, but he had all the tools and all the methods. So that's the first part. And uh, so is a, what says, uh, that's the first part, and then the come at the end, he said, after that, there is two kinds of tensor product, alpha prime and beta star, something like that, and I will show that they are the same. This is my main theorem. This is my main theorem. When you, when you look at this theorem, it doesn't seem much. I mean, for, for, for people who are not totally aware of all the development, it's a little. But if you look more carefully about this proof and so on, you discover that there is a fantastic inequality. The inequality is to take a real symmetric n by n matrix. Okay, how do you measure the size of this matrix? Well, the size of the eigenvalues, semi-simple, uh, I mean a, a symmetric real matrix, can be put in diagonal form. You look at the size of the eigenvalues. Second measure, take the maximum size of the element of the matrix, which is not independent of the basis, this one. And there is a certain inequality, I will not give it technically, there is a certain inequality which relates the maximum, suppose that, well, you put up, suppose you have a matrix Aij, all elements between 1 and minus 1, minus 1 and plus 1, and symmetry. What can you say about the eigenvalues, the size of the eigenvalues? That's a point. And the crucial point is that, well, for the identity, that for a given n by n matrix, there is a certain identity, it's not difficult to show. That's a standard, standard analysis that the function on a compact space at least is maximal. It's not more than that. But the crucial thing is that the bound you find 
is independent of the dark instrument. And that was a, that's a very efficient strategy to deal with problems in uh, infinite dimensional spaces. To, and this, this, the spirit of that came from probability theory. I mean, the work of Paul Levy and, and Wiener, I mean, is the, I mean, the limit theorem in probability can always be phrased in this way. For a given man, you have a certain inequality, which, well, if, if you are not very, if you don't ask many very detailed questions, it's easy to show that there exists a formula of a certain kind. But then, if you are more, more precise, then you can show that it's inevitable. Just an example. <coughs> If you take the n dimensional space with the ordinary distance Euclidean and volume, I take, uh, well, I take one and I take various spheres. Various spheres. Okay. What is the radius around which the mass concentrates? Quite not difficult to show that in the n dimensional space, if you take the, square, the sphere of radius, square root of n, so x1 squared plus xn squared is n, then almost all the mass is concentrated here. Same way, if you take a sphere with high dimension, if you take an, if you take an equator, an hyperplane, most of the mass is located. This is just, this is just a geometric way to express a central limit theorem in probability. So this is typical. Square, if you take the radius square root of n, I mean the estimate about the mass which is in the to be more precise in the, in the neighborhood of that, is independent of it. That's it. So, uh, Grotenlich discovers that. But then, so there is a very clever, there is a very clever identity that you have to prove. And, well, what has happened is that a, a short, when he finished his paper, he gave me a copy of his manuscript, and I wrote a report for the Bobaki seminar. And in the Bobaki seminar, there are two parts of my report. I say, the first one is cryptic, and I say that's the way Grotenik does things, and I describe in a few pages what he does. I mean, his various tensor products, his final reason. And now I will give you the key to the, to the way. And then the second part is I gave very explicit calculation with Bessel functions <laughs> and similar, similar things. Okay. Grotenik was not, I mean, this is typical of him. Grotenik was not fond of uh, algebraic analytical details. He always thought in large, in broad, he yeah, had a broad view. But he was not interested in doing a very, a very specific calculation, whether a number theoretic or analytical. And then he was, so when I, when I wrote this, this report, he was not very happy. He said, that, that, that was not what I had in mind. I said, I agree, but it's my way of looking at this, and I suppose that this second part will be prove more important. <laughs> Which is just a consequence of your reason. I don't claim any, any new result of my own. But finally, I mean, when people develop these ideas, it was exactly the kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, estimate it was needed. But it was typical that the cell function did not appeal to me. Well, I mean, the uh, Laplace operator in general appealed to him, but. How to solve it in practice? <laughs> harmonic, harmonic, harmonic functions and uh, harmonic spherical harmonics and so on. Well, things which are very familiar to an analyst or to someone doing um, doing a mathematical physics, he was not very happy. That was his way. Always looking in very general terms. Okay, so that's the end. And then, as I said, there was uh, this paper was <coughs> hardly well. It was not very, uh, not, did not have much influence except that Pizier uh, took it and developed his theory in which he is still very active and has a, a very good school working on that. So, but I, I doubt that Gottenli could have been happy to see that. Okay. So that's the end of his, uh, well, that's his work in functionalities. Now the next, what I will try to discuss now in a few minutes, is a transition. How he got from this function analysis to algebraic geometry. And it took place in a few years. So this paper, this paper, this final paper about uh, the metric properties of tens of, of uh, Banach spaces was written in 40, 54 and published in 56, something like that. At that time, he was already back to France when he had found, uh, I think, the roots of Cineres have changed a little enough 
to allow him to have a position at CNRS at the time. So uh, already in the late six, 50s, he had a position at CNRS a few years before coming here, because as you know, the, this institute was created in 1958, not in this place, they moved in 1962, but the first part, the first start, the first start of, this, of the IHS was 58. So Grotenik managed to have a position at CNRS, which was quite new. There were very few foreigners to get it, and he was not even a foreigner, he was a stateless. Okay, so, but then uh, Grotenik went to France and uh, and he decided, to, he said what it was, uh, he, he decided to settle. On the other hand, his mother, I mean, as long as his mother was alive, he lived with his mother and uh, in a kind of very close connection. They were living together. She died in 58 or 59, something like that, 58. So I remember, I remember shortly before she died, I mean, we had a, a, a private meeting of Bobaki, and he was a member of Bobaki at the time, and he came with his mother. Came with his mother, I remember very well, that was something like uh, 58, 59. He came with his mother. She was already very weak, and she died shortly after that. And I remember we had a, we had a, a walk in the mountains, in the Alps, in the Alps, together, we were alone. I mean, look, what I myself. And he confessed to me, my mother, the dream of my mother was to write novels. Maybe it's what I have to do. Maybe it's what I have to do. And I already did some doubts about what was his, what was his, uh, his vocation. I said, no, 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 no. Later on, later on, but not at the moment. You are full of beautiful ideas, develop them. But I remember this discussion somewhere in the arc. And uh, then, uh, But his mother died shortly after that, uh, early 60s, something like that, I don't remember for sure. And uh, psychologically, it was a great change for him. He had been in, com in a sense, he was isolated with his mother. He was, a, how do you say, I mean, the, uh, very... Well, very close connection, I would say. And uh, so... I will not, but it would be another talk to require another talk to speak of the relation of Kotelnik with women. <laughs> it's another subject, <laughs> not for today, not for today. And uh, it's clear that after the death of his wife, there was a great change. Okay. Just see that. So, but then Kotelnik came, was, uh, was given a position at CNNS, and I remember a, a discussion in the spring of uh, 53 or 54, and he, he commented, I remember he commented to me, oh, of course. Bobaki cannot make anything else than to recruit both of us, <laughs> which took a few years to, to realize. Okay, so, and then, so Grotenik was, uh, I mean, he, he collaborated with Bobaki for a number of years, at least six or seven years, and he was uh, very active. He, he had a very good influence on that. He was very active. I mean, he gave us many drafts, uh, which were not published, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we had drafts to, to develop things. And, and finally, when he left Bobaki, it was partly out of a misunderstanding because uh, he had uh, well, there a, a serious misunderstanding that he wanted to force us to start again. And he said, set theory is no more the, the, true, the true framework. The, the, the best framework is category theory. The point is that we all agree with him. We all knew category at the time. Well, whether it was Carton, whether it was Serre, which was Borel, which was myself, and all. We all knew the advantages of category. But we had already 15 volumes published, and we did not want to start again. <laughs> so we had to make a compromise. But he was quite unhappy about that. And uh, then the other, well, something which is unfortunate, I mean, there was a clash, personal clash between André Veil and, and Grotenby. Nothing serious, nothing serious. Well, on, André Veil could be quite nasty, quite sarcastic. And uh, he made a comment, I mean, in some dis mathematical discussion, I mean, André Veil made a nasty comment, and Grotenik was unhappy with that, so he <laughs> I left immediately the room. When was it? 60, 61, 60 or 61. I suppose, according to my recollection, 61. 
summer 61, I suppose. Well, I can locate that with my old recollection of all the things. Okay, so, but then he stayed with us for six years, which was a great benefit. He did. But finally, we could not put them. But what the result of this was that there was a peace treaty, a peace treaty which was the following. Bobaki will develop so-called commutative algebra up to that point, and you will start at that point. So there will be no overlap, basically no overlap. So all the preliminary algebra which is needed for the AGA, the modular geometry algebra, is already well, a large part of it is contained in, in Bobaki, but without the geometrical description. And it was decided that when you really begin to do geometry, that is the point. And it's, it was so much easier because on both sides, who was the pen? Who wrote the books for Bobaki? Who wrote the book for Gotteni? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it was easy to arrange that. Okay. So, but then I will just mention about the transition of Gotteni. So the transition of Gotteni is in the following. So I mentioned that he had these nuclear spaces, which are analytical counterpart of so-called uh, 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 so-called um, flat modules. One of the properties of flat modules, the definition is that if you have an exact sequence, you take the tensor product with a flat module, it remains exact. A consequence, a rather formal consequence, is a so-called Kunet theorem. That means how to calculate if you have two complexes, if you take the tensor product of the two complexes, how you calculate the chromology of the tensor product? If you have no, no special property, it's quite complicated. What is known is that you have, you have a certain spectral sequence which is not very easy to manipulate. But then if you make some assumption of flatness, it's rather easy and formal to derive the form you want. If you have this complex with cohomology A, this complex with cohomology B, take the tensor product of the complexes, cohomology is the tensor product of the cohomology, which is immensely useful if you want. So, Gotenik, of course, out of generality, he knew that there was something known, the other, that there was something like the, the Kunet theorem in, in uh, homological algebra. And he, he understood, he understood properly what was the core of the proof and translated it immediately using these this nuclear spaces. But, If you take, if you take a, a, a function in one variable, smooth function of different function in one variable, you multiply it by tensor product to another one, and you want to calculate the so-called uh, the Durand cohomology, it tells you that under suitable condition, the Durand cohomology of a product of spaces is a tensor product of the cohomology of the spaces. And then all the formal properties of well, what he has shown is that not only he had an uh, abstract category of, of uh, nuclear spaces, which have the right Fernandez property, but he knew that many, many examples fit with that. So all, basically all standard function spaces are flat spaces, in the, uh, the nuclear spaces in this sense. Okay, so, uh, so he produced, he, he gave a version of this, and I remember there was a seminar of, uh, of uh, Laurent Schwartz devoted to the work of Rotterdam in analysis, and it was my task to give an exposition of that, so I remember it very well. I have to explain to explain this in the in, in first seminar. So, and then, but what is discovered is that at the same time, Dolbo made a breakthrough. He understood that there was a D-bar cohomology, and that this D-bar cohomology, but he, he wanted to show what is known as the Poincaré lemma for D-bar cohomology. That's something with the D-bar close it locally a D-bar of something. Okay. Then uh, Dolbo knew that, and he tried repeatedly to prove it, but he never succeeded. But he had discovered the, the true notion and the true lemma. And he developed in his thesis many, many consequences of this, which was a, still, still a very useful tool in, a, in a functional well, in, in the differential geometry for complex uh, analytic space. Okay, it was so. It was, but then he was unable to prove the, to prove the, 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 the basic lemma. And I recently had a discussion with him, and he called. He yes, that's true. I did not prove. It. Okay. So, but then in some Carton seminars, there is a proof by Serre, which is credited to Gotenkirch. 
using exactly this functional analytical tool. So then he developed the DBARC object, which was a very important tool at the time for differential geometry and, and topology of complex spaces. And then, so he developed this, and, uh, and then, of course, he immediately understood what he could do. And there were other, at the time, there were other problems, difficult problems of analysis connected with the work of uh, Serre, the Serre duality. I mean, the first version required quite a difficult analysis, and Grotendieck or Laurent Schwartz provided the right method to do that. So, and then Grotendieck was interested by that. Oh, okay, my method gives you something. It was, uh, of course, the peak of the activity of the day. This was the uh, In Paris area, it was really the, the thing to do, the thing to do. Uh, around the Carton Seminar, and he understood that he had the tools. So he published a few papers in this direction, and then gradually he said, okay. But then when there the breakthrough was said, the paper on uh, coherent sheets, which shows how to mimic this method in functional, uh, functional analysis and many complex variables to apply them in pure algebra. It was really the breakthrough. And of course, Gotendik had, Gotendik had, of, he had all the tools to do that. And typically, again, so, but there was a, a technical problem. The theory of shifts developed by Leray, by Leray, was very, had been developed by Leray first, by Carton, Serre, and other people, and Borel also. But they concentrated on finite dimensional spaces. At the time, looking at infinite dimensional space, well, calculus of variation. Of course, it's calculus of variation, but I mean the so-called uh, direct method of calculus of variation. But people were still hesitant, hesitant. Okay. So linear theory after Banach was well understood, but the non-linear theory was well, still, still, still full of mysteries. So um, there was so there was this. Uh, This, this theory, and so, okay. So, um, Grot so Grotendieck was, uh, was aware of that, and, uh, and uh, so, well, okay. There was people who had this technical difficulty of uh, commerge of infinite dimensional space. So, for instance, the thesis of, of Serre consists of two parts. One part, which is foundation, which is painful, because the fear of Leroy did not apply directly, so they had to rebuild everything from one, well, to, to rebuild everything. And then the last part, of course, it, pff, all the consequences, magnificent consequences about homotopy, etc. So uh, that was, uh, uh, and then Serre, another time when he developed his method of so-called coherent shifts, had to face a new difficulty. Of course, Anyone who does reasonable analysis or uh, topology assumes that all spaces are Hausdorff spaces. Non Hausdorff spaces. Do they really exist? No one takes them seriously. For a long time, no one took them seriously. But, but, the great discovery of both Veil and then, and then Serre, which was first the Veil who discovered it, is that the proper topology to use in algebraic geometry was the so called, the so -called Zariski topology. Lazarisky topology is certainly not Hausdorff. Not Hausdorff. The, op the neighborhood of, uh, if you have a neighborhood of a point, is enormous, enormous. And so if you have two points, all neighbors of this point will be to all neighbors, neighborhood of this point. So far, very far from being, from being Hausdorff space. And then all the theory assumes that the spaces were Hausdorff. And the, and the cell had to rebuild another time <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to feed the screw for another kind of spaces. And then, of course, it was a major problem. Anyone in the end of the 50s acknowledged that it was a major problem. And Rotendieck solved it exactly by his ordinary way. He did not try to prove that shift theory would extend to that or that uh, under some conditions, uh, relaxing some conditions and so on. He took things from the sky. He said, what is needed to have a theory of shifts? We knew from we knew from algebra that <laughs> to, to in homological algebra the notion of projective resolution is a very important one. But to construct a projective resolution is very easy because the free module is projective and so free modules are everywhere. 
But if you believe in duality, and for instance, I, I don't know, would always insist. If you have a diagram with a hose in this side, take the diagram with a hose that side. And so, if you have a notion of projective, which is very natural, very easy to do, you have a dual notion of injecting, which is quite complicated. And, uh, and, uh, but then, if you wanted to apply the algebraic method to shift your we knew that projective, projective resolution would lead nowhere. I mean, there are many reasons for that. Projective resolution would lead nowhere. But what about injective resolution? But injective resolution, you need to build a certain class of shifts called injective shifts with a certain property. It doesn't matter. Well, Kotelnik did not try that. He said, I take not a given space, I take the category of all shifts, what he called a topos after that. And he still considers that it's one of his major discoveries. You replace the space as a category of all shifts. And you ex express everything in terms of the category of shifts. Okay. Now, what? So, next question. If you want to have an injective shift and injective evolution, what kind of general property should the category of shifts that is? <coughs> then he develops this. This is big paper, so called Torku paper. He develops this at length. He comes with some condition called AB5 star, for whatever reason. AB5 star, because he has AB1, AB2, AB5, and then the variant which is AB5. And then he said, okay. Uh, assuming these very, very general properties of a category, I can do everything. Now, end of the proof, I take the specific category of sheets, and this AB5 star condition is very easy to, to check. No. No. <laughs> so, we have been many people to struggle with many particular cases, trying to extend it. He can't everything. Overnight. So, and this has been, oh well, I will not suppose I have enough now. Uh, I will just finish in a few minutes. And then uh, what he had, he repeated this strategy many times, many times. And then every time he invented, I mean, he always invented the most abstract notion, the most abstract notion, and knew how to use it. Of course, this has its limits. This method has its, its limitations. Well, there is a famous story of in maybe the room next to here, a discussion where someone asked, well, what was saying, I take a, a, take a prime P, and so on. And so on, I suppose it was, it was the Mazur. He's the only one who could do that. But which prime number? And what out of the Mazur? 57. <laughs> Everyone knows that 57 is not a prime number. I know all the prime numbers up to a few hundred by heart, so I know it's not a prime number. But, but Gotten did not know. And he did not have any appeal to him. He never tried to do explicit calculation, even with ordinary numbers. He, a number P was a letter to represent the prime with certain properties, etc. But, well, of course, he knew 2, 3, 5. <laughs> but, but beyond that, he, he did not know them and did not care for them. That's a point. He did not care for them. So, yes, of course, it's an anecdote, but it's typical. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's typical. Of it. It's typical. Of it. And so, but then, Grotendieck again, when it was uh, finished with that, uh, when you have to, to understand the nightmare and uh, the nightmare of algebraic geometry in late 40s and 50s. I myself, I suppose, I learned three or four times the beginning of algebraic geometry. First, in the, in the big book of André Vey, Foundation of Algebraic Geometry, which is not the most pleasant place to learn. Second, I was aware of the paper by, by Zariski, and many difficulties understanding him. And then, what was a little better, the, the book of uh, Samuel and Zariski on the uh, commutative algebra, which is a good, very good exposition. Then, Chevalier <laughs> produced his own version. Serre produced his own version. And when it came to, to, to finish writing my thesis, I was faced with the problem of what kind of foundation do I take? Because I needed some result which belonged to the foundation, to the, to the, to the, to the presentation by Landry Veit, other one by Chevalier, other one by Serre, and I had to mix them. So I built a certain compromise in my thesis. The first chapter is describing a certain compromise, and then out of that, I could use all the available tools and prove what I wanted to prove, a certain duality theorem. 
which was a question of major question of family values, which I solved in my thesis. And I remember Gordon Dick discussing about my thesis in, uh, this time. He said, "What you did is not proper. You knew the general definition of a scheme. It's true. I knew it, but I was not the only one." All well, this, as you know, when a new idea comes, I mean, there are a number of people who interact very, very heavily among each other to say whether it was, uh, whether it was, uh, whether it was good indeed, whether myself, what well, doesn't matter. We were all aware of what was needed. And we had variants, and I, I produced, we well, produced eventually the, the, the definition by, by, by Gottenberg. What you should do in your thesis is to give the foundations of that. I say, my dear, no, I want to finish my thesis. <laughs> I want to finish my thesis. Of course, it's a compromise. Very unhappy compromise, but at least it enables me to give the proof. And I'm quite confident that once the proof of foundation will be given, my proof will translate immediately, which was, of course, true. So, that, but it was typical. And then, um, again, again, and so, so at the time, a major breakthrough by Grotenik was this proof of the so-called Riemann Roch Herzogburg für Amiso version, which is very, uh, very, very great, great, very great progress. I mean, when, the, when the, uh, I remember Herzogburg commenting on that, he was totally, totally surprised. And uh, so, but then in this, uh, um, yes, in this proof, what, if, if the story is amusing. I was in Princeton, that was uh, fall. 57, I was at the uh, Institute as a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, and Sir spent most of his uh, the full term in, 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 at the Institute at the time. And Borel was there, and they was not yet there, but to get so the great, 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 great days. And then Gothenburg sent a letter, a letter to, a le sent a letter to, 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 to Sir. At the time, I mean, the, the tax on the uh, air. <laughs> the air fair for letters are very high. So he used very thin paper <laughs> with double ma with simple margin <laughs> to type it. How many pages? Uh, altogether it was 40 pages in two or three instalments. So we received it week after week, is and then and then I remember I begged from 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 Sir, I begged from Sir, Sir was away for a couple of days, I begged that he would lent to me this paper, and then I made a, co a better copy, I made a better copy of my typewriter, and, that, and then it was distributed to all the people who were interested. And then, uh, so, <coughs> but then it was really, really a breakthrough, really a breakthrough, all full of, a lot of new ideas, especially K-theory was invented there. But I, I remember that at the time we say, when we made an exposition of this, we had this seminar, which was finally written by Sam and Borel, published under the name of Sam and Borel, K theory, we said, it's too abstract, too general. So we do what we have to do, but we try to escape it. And he was right, of course. We were wrong. We were wrong, and he was right. So what has happened is that, but at some point it's interesting. At some point, why did Gottschalk refuse to, to put his name on the, on the paper? Because he was unhappy about a part of his proof. In a part of his proof, he was doing a, he was doing a certain explicit construction of algebraic geometry, which we call now blow up, which is a very, very important method. But at the time, it looked like an ad hoc tool. And then Grotenik used this tool, and he was unhappy. No, 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 no. My proof is not natural. My proof is not natural. Again, typical. It should come from directly from the sky. I don't have to 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 to, to play with this uh, complicated construction. And that was, this is not yet a final proof. Finally, when he published under his own name the proof 10 years later, <laughs> of course, but he had understood better what the meaning of all laws, and then he had no restrictions to publish it later. So, okay. So, I suppose it's time to stop. And uh, thank you very Conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the conclusion is what is that? This is the first part. Gotenik was special. Gotenik was special, and uh, but he, he was a genius. 
But I don't recommend to ordinary people to follow Moore's method. <laughs> I mean, he, or, he knew his method. He was, he, he was maybe the only one who could use that kind of method. Very upset. And also, I, maybe a, another comment is about what happened. There was a miracle in this place. A miracle in space in the 50s and 60s. What happened? There was an unexpected collaboration between three persons totally different. Rotendieck, the prophet. Dieu donné, ha, what work. And Serre, the very street logician, might. And so, if you look at the exchange of letters between Rotendieck and Serre, which is fantastic, you will see that Rotendieck goes always into fantasy. If I could play that, I would, etc. And Serre, no, 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 57 is not one. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend you use this. It's very interesting. Also, what is interesting is that after that, we all know that when Grotenik left this place around 70, he engaged into political activities. And uh, well, we did not speak of the green at the time, but it was, of course, the same spirit. Uh, hippies and green, a combination of the Green Party with hippie, hippie movement. And then, uh, It's uh, he, so he was interested that in, uh, the occasion to leave this institute was supposedly one well, you know more about that supposedly a question about uh, finance financing of this institute would I mean, uh, by some army army uh, army office but well, I will not enter into this discussion but then Rotendick Rotendick was of course. Uh, uh, <coughs> I suppose what you could suppose that after his leaving, he was deeply engaged into political activities. But the truth, and if you look at what I said from his father and his mother, you would see that he was deeply politically engaged. No, from 1950, when for 1947 or 50, when he started mathematics to 68 or 69, he did not pay any attention that was behind around him. Of course. These were the very difficult times of the war in Vietnam between France and Vietnam, and after, and after that, well, the war between Vietnam and America came after that. And then there was a war in Algeria between France and Algeria at the time. He did not pay any attention to that. He did not pay any attention to that. You can find in this letter to, to, to say a, a letter where he, where he complained that, well, he, he, he said, well, don't you ask Carton? to manage so that the young mathematicians do, do not have to be laughed. <laughs> okay, that, it makes no sense. And I remember in 65 when De Gaulle was forced to a runoff by Mitterrand, the first time in 65. Between, the, after, after the first day of the election, I met Grotendieck and he asked me, well, is it true that France will have no more president? I said, your conviction is anarchist. You ain't stay. You ain't head of stay. So you will be happy. Well, but <laughs> maybe you need a president for that, he said. And, and then I, I, had to, I had to use 10 minutes to explain to him what was the run off, what was the legal rule, what was the constitution. He knew nothing, nothing. 65. 65. He knew really nothing about politics. Now, what's the politics? Thing? ordinary way, or I mean, about laws, uh, legalities, and so on. He was totally on board of that. And also, interestingly enough, he had one occasion when he had, uh, his first child was born when he was a student in Nancy from his young lady. Well, complicated story, but, but at least his son, uh, his son, uh, what is his name? His, uh, hello, his son. Uh, okay. He had also. Uh, he's very close. Well, he has been very close to him. And then, uh, when he when he was on the way to marry with uh, um, uh, with Mireille, who was his wife when he was here, I mean, he, he, he made a fantasy to make a legal claim to have the custody of his firstborn son. He was not even married with Mireille, and he wanted. So we wanted. So he came to us for advice and we said, boo, 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 <laughs> it doesn't look very good. And he said, but you know, the French law allows me to be my own lawyer. Of course, 
low, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> if your case is not a very good, if your case was a very good case, you could do that. But if, since your case doesn't appear to be a very good case, if you are on low, low, you, you will be defeated. And that's what has happened. So he came to the court and pleaded for himself, which is legal, which is legal. <laughs> and he was totally ignored, totally ignored. So. And later on, when he was prosecuted in the, in the 70s, oh, it was a very nasty occasion, very nasty occasion, and he was prosecuted for having given shelter to some Buddhist monk who was a kind of hippie and so on. And then so he was, and um, he was brought to court on the occasion that he was hosting uh, foreign people without proper ID cards. Okay. It was true, it was true. So, but then, then, then he made his own, well, we had, I remember a long, long discussion. So he came to Paris to ask for advice and help. So Schwartz and him were okay. And we had, a, I remember, six hour of discussion convincing him that we had a good lawyer who knew all these kind of cases. And that, he, we, so finally we made a compromise that the lawyer would describe the work, play. And then uh, after that, Gotten, they would say, no, 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 Gotten, he would say a few words, but now explaining his, pos his position, which is what we have, is, still exists in so many other forms. But he said, now for the legal conclusion, I leave it to, to master so-and-so <laughs> to say it. <laughs> But we had a long discussion to convince him that it was a proper way to do. And final part, that's a lot of time. <laughs> but so just to explain that it was very difficult for him to, to tackle with ordinary life. Social behavior was totally alien. He was politically very naive, but yes. I think his feeling against power was authentic and well rooted. Right, 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 right. But he, he didn't know how to maneuver. <laughs> Thank you very much.